What's going on, Salt Strong Nation? I've got a really cool podcast for you guys today. I've seen a lot of folks in the community talking about they've been heading out to try and go fish for reds, but there has been some terrible winds lately here in Texas. We got up to 68 miles an hour just two days ago, and I've got a friend here who's been fishing in some really big redfish tournaments in this terrible weather, and I've got him here to share some tips with you guys today so you don't got to sit at home and wait out the windstorms. You can get out there and start catching redfish faster. So welcome, Caleb McCumber. Thank you so so much for coming on today. We are very excited to hear some awesome redfish tips and fishing in some nasty weather from you. Man, man oh man, where do we start? Uh, the, 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 you, play, you can play down the, uh, you know, what the weather was until you mentioned 68 miles an hour, right? That was the, uh, I'm over here in Louisiana. I fished the Excalibur last week out of Delacro, and now I'm at the, the Professional Redfish League first stop in Homa. And I think we've have experienced it all. We've had the 30 out of the south, out of the east, out of the west. We uh, very similar to when I was in the Redfish World Series last year. It, we were on high tides. You know, it, I would I wouldn't say easy fishing. It was still blowing pretty dang hard every day, but the tides were up. The water was pretty clear, and we could we could make do. We were on some really good fish and very excited. And then. Here comes that west wind and dumps a, dumps four feet of water out of the marsh in about 24 hours. And, you know, being a guide back in Texas and being a recreational angler my entire life, the the go-to thing is, is man, I'm going to stay home and watch TV tomorrow. But <laughs> unfortunately, in this line, you don't get to do that. You, uh, you a, the, the, the most difficult thing to start the day is getting your boat off the trailer in the ramps is... We had guys that their the front of their boats were hanging up on the trailers because the tide was so low that the ramp got steep and their boats wouldn't even come off the dang trailer, man. And but you know it it's one of those things where you know I called you an hour ago and said, hey, let's make let's let's have some fun and make a podcast. And we well, shouldn't you be out pre fishing right now? Well, I should, but it's blowing thirty five today. Tomorrow those winds or south thirty five today. Tomorrow the wind shifts to north twenty. And then we're east on Friday and Saturday, and it's one of those things where I could go out today and I could do all the scouting in the world, but it's going to change tomorrow and the next day and the day after that. And so that's kind of where the topic of our conversation is, is headed is what do you do when you have to go out there whenever everything you've known for the past week is just scrambled? You know, that, that's what I told somebody earlier this week. I said, man, these redfish's eggs are scrambled. We just got to go out there, fish, figure it out. Uh, Daniel and I were sitting at the, we're, we were in the boat Friday morning. Um, I, I, I feel like I frustrate my partner greatly because I don't, I'm not the best at staying up all night and coming up with a game plan. So finally, uh, or I'm sorry, it was Saturday morning because we'd already fished Friday. These are all two day tournaments. And uh, Saturday morning we get in the boat and I look at him and I said, well, here's what we're going to do today. We're going fishing. And he looked at me like, man, why couldn't you have said that last night? He's like, I didn't know last night. I've got to come look and see what the situation is and respond to it. And so I, I think we're going to have a lot of fun talking about, you know, what you do to try to make things work, you know, whenever the weather is just in acclimat, it's, uh, you know, it, it's just, it's just a mess out there. Yeah, yeah, no, that's what I'm most excited to do because a lot of folks, you know, they're out there trying to pre-plan a trip and they're looking at conditions, you know, two days before most folks are, are those weekend warriors and uh, you're looking at that weather, you know, Wednesday, Thursday to try and figure out what you're going to do, start kind of planning your spots out. And with wind that just keeps switching and the forecast really just can't be trusted, uh, like you, I've even just kind of not made a plan until day of because all the conditions never seem to be what they were forecasted two days prior. When you get really heavy winds like this, and it's just completely variable. So I'm right there with you. You got to make adjustments on the water when you get there. So I think one of the first things that folks probably have on their minds on you know, how are you getting on these fish? Cause you said, you know, we were on some good fish and then the conditions changed. So that puts you in the same shoes as them. They're getting out to the ramp forecast is not correct. You know, the wind is now shifted and especially in areas like we have where it's mainly wind driven tides rather than, you know, what you have on like the East coast where you get four or five foot tide swings where a North wind can completely dry out a marsh. So I want you to kind of talk about how when you get out there and you've got different types of winds or different sets of conditions, 
how do you kind of start picking general areas to start looking for fish? And then we'll talk about, you know, when you get to those types of spots, how are you zeroing in on that kind of 90, 10 zone? Well, the, the key to what we do and, you know, we're hedging our bets. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're a fishing guide, if you're a pro tournament, if you're a weekend guy, you just, we're hedging our bets. And, you know, the last weekend's tournament was a prime example of, you know, the, 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 the Excalibur series is pretty well the top of the top. Everybody in this tournament has a chance to bring massive weights to the skill, but only six out of, you know, 20 teams were able to do it while everybody was doing the same thing, right? But the, the key that I have found throughout all levels of fishing is begin looking at it from a macro perspective. And by that, I mean, I want to know what the water levels were for the past three to four days. What do they are today? Yes, that matters to me. And that's where you shift from a micro perspective to a, I mean, a macro to a micro. But understanding the macro at the beginning is, is big time key. And so, you know, going back, because I'm going to use a lot of analogies from what I've seen over the past 10 days over here. And it was from the macro perspective, Friday, the tides were absolutely gone. The flats that we had been on catching fish were dry. Wyatt, let me ask you a question. Have you ever seen a group of seagulls walking backwards in the wind where their faces up wind and their butts downwind? <laughs> no. Entire groups of them. And the reason they were doing it, if they turn around the other way, the wind blew their butt feathers over their eyes and they didn't like it apparently. I'm I mean this is how this is how big of a of a weather shift we had on Friday. But if you're talking about them if, if you're the guy that shows up to the ramp on Friday and those tides are dumped out but if you have you didn't have to be, be there to see it yourself if you've just been reading your your actuals on your NOAA websites and whatnot, you knew that the tide was up 2 feet the days before. Those redfish were up on the flats. They were up on top of the grass. They were munching on all the springtime little baits. So now we're here Friday. The water's dropped out. We're looking at it as a right now, um, what I call a micro perspective. And what we did and what almost everybody did in that situation was we went and fished the channels and the somewhat deeper water that was right near those flats that had water up on them the days before. As these these fish they're on a springtime pattern they want to be in those ponds they want to be in that grass and they're not going to go real far from where they know there's food at they're going to be hanging close waiting for that tide to come back to get back in there so that would be probably the number one key that you know i could bring to the table whenever that situation has shifted so drastically what was the situation right before and what are those fish waiting for the situation to be afterwards yeah, no, that's 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 a really good tip right there to kind of think about what those feeding patterns, where they were holding, if you were observing fish, knowing what they were doing and, ha and now observing what the wind is going to do if it knocks all the water off of a flat or if it pushes water onto a flat, you know, knowing what they were doing and now making the adjustments with the wind, what it's, what it's kind of adjusted the water level to, that's really big. Now, I do have a quick question. Something I see in the community a lot is, people asking whether wind is going to blow bait to a certain side of a marsh or something like that. Have you observed that really heavy winds will force a lot of bait against the shoreline? I mean, I've seen mullets swim against the wind. So I want to know if this is kind of, as someone that's out as a guide and a tournament angler, what do you observe in situations like that? It's not a proven every time science, but yes, I have seen redfish absolutely stacked across uh, on the windward shoreline. I have seen bait stacked there, and I've seen that, you know, just being – I've done it many times over in Matagorda, guiding and tournament-wise, where I'm on a big lake, and the windy side is and – it, and it's still blowing while I'm there. It's power pole down. It's throw your gulps, throw your popping corks, you know, throw whatever you can because it's, the water's muddy. It's not really a – it's not a sight cast situation. It's not really just throw a swim bait and let it come back situation. It's a – it's a loud cork. It's maybe a loud topwater or something like that. And the fishing is really good, even though it looks terrible because the, the water's all mudded up. And then there's other situations to where those fish, they're on the protected side. They, for, for whatever reason, they want to be in that little bit cleaner water. They want to be working, working less hard to, you know, swim and stay upright. So it, it both can, both can happen. And I've really 
maybe there's somebody out there that's figured it out. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty realistic guy in saying that I'm not one of the ones that has said, okay, this is what's happening. They're going to be on the windy side today. Uh, you know, and that, and that's what we see over here whenever, but the, the, the funny part about it is, is over here where I'm at, you, it's really cool in that you can see the fish in most of the places. And if I go in one or two ponds and they're on the leeward side, well, that's where they're going to be in almost all the ponds. And if I go on one and two ponds and they're on the windward side, that's where they're going to, they're going to be in all the other ponds. It's, it's, it, there's something in that fish that triggers it to be on one side or the other, uh, until we get there and figure it out i don't know i mean may, maybe one of your listeners has it figured it out and they'll put it in the comments down below and 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 ho and if you see that Wyatt, you let me know because i need every advantage i can get over here <laughs> no i've wondered that myself because i've always tried to to really put myself in the situation okay the water let's let's take the water levels out of it you've got really heavy winds and i've had some killer days especially in the spring fishing those wind-blown shorelines with popping corks or, you know, really loud lures or even really flashy spoons because it, it, is, it is disgustingly muddy in those areas. I don't personally like fishing that. Uh, I really like the clear water where I can see dust-offs. I get more data from what's happening around me. So I do usually opt for calmer and clear shorelines, but that's not to say that the action sometimes isn't completely focused on the dirtier shorelines. So it's really cool to kind of hear that it, it is really a – you need to go and observe and figure out whether it's the windblown shoreline or the, you know, protected shoreline. Because for me, it's always go to the protected shoreline, get your data. If you're not seeing anything, then yeah, go to the windblown. But uh, it, it doesn't sound like there's necessarily a formula per se for, you know, wind protection or windblown when it is these really nasty, nasty days. Uh, granted, I'm sure that some folks that don't have power poles or some folks that don't have the equipment to fish windblown shorelines um, might opt for those, those calmer areas. Uh, maybe that's why I do it, but um, it sounds like you need to be able to be open to fish both of them. I would, I would be more apt to, to be find a point where the wind's blowing it around the protected side and you know you're having your your bait and your everything pushed past that point but like you said check one if that doesn't work check the other if you don't have the equipment to do one or the other then you know grind it out see what happens is is the <laughs> the number one rule about fish is they don't give a dang what we think we know about them they're gonna they're gonna do their thing and uh sometimes we guessed right sometimes we didn't but they, they can absolutely be on either side. And there's no reason if you're not having luck on one to not be, to be scared of trying the other one. Mm -hmm. And in these situations where it's really high winds, really, you know, nasty weather, do you find the fish are more locked on bottom? And again, we are, we are after redfish here because you are a redfish pro. We're not talking about trout or flounder or any other species here. Redfish in, the, in these, you know, shallow water situations, do you find them more locked down uh, and kind of situated in one zone waiting to ambush bait? Or are you seeing them more moving around and kind of hunting for bait? Because I feel that would change how you approach and how you fish certain areas if you're really kind of search baiting them with paddle tails or if you're really finessing through with jerk baits or you know something that's gonna gonna kind of catch their attention and scalpel through uh when they're 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 locked down you know i find that it depends on what is causing that weather pattern uh we've had times where the fishing was absolutely phenomenal i Daniel and I, we won a uh, tournament last year, the year before, during a tropical storm. It was 40 to 50 mile an hour winds. It was those big black clouds that are just above the boat and lightning and, and raining. It was awful. But the fish were up on top. They were floating. We went into a pond. We got there about 7 in the morning. At 8.30 in the morning, we're headed home with two fish over 9 pounds. And that's because we could have caught as many as we wanted. They're floating everywhere. They're just, you know, the pressure's low. They're feeling good. You know, they're out feeding. Now you turn around and today your weather is windy and nasty because there's a front coming through or there was a front came through yesterday. Well, now you're dealing with the barometer spikes and the things that will quite often lock a fish up on bottom. And those are the times whenever you have to take it real slow um, you know, throw something that, that maybe aggravates them. I, myself, I, I, I wouldn't be caught dead throwing a top water. I'd be throwing a paddle tail. I'd be throwing maybe a spinner bait, uh, something like that and take it slow and just fish, 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 you know, and, 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 and that's what every, every one of us had to do during that, that, because it was, it was a frontal passage that got us last weekend. 
And it was one of those things where you could throw a bait 50 times in the same spot to catch one fish. Well, we were, we, we knew that there was 30 fish in that spot. I could see them moving around. I could see their mud. I could see their wakes. And it just took that long to finally get one to eat. So it depends a lot on your weather pattern. You know, if it, if it's a low, that is just creating wind and some rain and stuff. It's not going to be as tough as a high pressure system coming in. You know, that, that'd probably be the two ways that I would look at it there. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, we're talking about a lot of the stuff that we would throw at these fish and, and kind of keeping that same mindset that it is windy. It's hard to cast. You might have to cast against the wind. Water is completely murked up and you usually do fish down in Matagorda, some muddier kind of more murked up water. It's not necessarily that kind of chocolate that you can't see to the bottom. Sometimes it's stained. I've been out there with you. Uh, but it's, it's, a kind of dirtier clarity. Um, now getting into that really windy day, how does your either color presentation or the types of lures that you're throwing so you can efficiently fish an area, how does that all change? What is your arsenal going out into that day? Uh, you know, I'll, re I'll react by on colors by the watercolor. And by the way, Mr. Elitist, we call that sandy green in Matagorda. Okay. All right. It's, okay. it's, it's, murky is not a word for us. All right. I, I understand that we're not in Rockport. Okay. <laughs> but uh, it depends a lot on the sun and the cloud cover as far as colors. Um, if I've got sun and, and then I'll probably throw a pearl or something with some glitter in it. If it's cloudy, then I'm probably throwing a red shad, a, a Texas roach, something black, something like that. But more importantly, I want something that will get the fish's attention and, and get a reaction from them. So uh, that's spinner baits. Uh, not much in Texas, but you know, for your listeners that are Louis Louisiana around to South Carolina, um, I like chatter baits a lot over here. It's got they got noise, they've got vibration. Um, again, if we're on a, if you're on a low pressure bite, then a top water may work. If you're on a high pressure bite, I really don't mess with that. I just want something that is going to rattle, something that is going to create disturbance in the water. And, and bring them over to where I'm at. Now, if I get into an area where it's rather calm, say say you're in a drain or something where the water, there's not a lot of chop on the water. The wind's blowing above your head, but the water's still pretty smooth and nice, and then and therefore it's quiet in the water. And then that's where I wouldn't be scared to, you know, throw a, a little rat tail or something and hop it on bottom. But bottom's the key. Bottom, the bottom is the key whenever... I'm fishing that really nasty high pressure stuff. I'm putting it on the bottom, hop, 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 give it a minute, hop, 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 give it a minute. And, and just trying to elicit a reaction strike. I don't know if elicit is the word either way, just entice. trying to get a reaction strike. <laughs> elicit. Yeah, entice. That's what I'm looking for. I feel like elicit is, is, is something that I'm, I feel like I'm not supposed to even say that word on a podcast. I'm not sure, <laughs> uh, but yeah. Uh, if it's muddy and, and nasty, I want something that rattles a lot. If I can get some flash out of it, great. Um, if the if the weather is just bad, but the water itself looks all right, then you know I'm not scared to throw a rat tail or something. But uh, typically, I'm going to keep the lure lowers uh, lures pretty low in the water column. Gotcha. Um, so I think conventional wisdom and and pretty much all the anglers that I've talked to in dirty water, windy water one of the best lures out there to use. And as someone that's on the water, I love when I have someone that's, that's a guide or is on the water every day like you are, because I can ask this question and get like true, I've observed this feedback. Do you feel that spoons outperform other lures on days like this, you know, where it's windy, it's nasty, um, more than other lures? And then I'm gonna have a follow up on the, the spoon color. But first I wanna hear if you feel like spoons are like the secret lure for windy days. I feel like I'm really going to let you down on this one. Mm. I, I really feel like I'm going to let you down. I have been saying on my own YouTube channel and stuff for years, I'm going to throw lures. I'm, 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 I'm going to throw spoons. I'm going to, you know, figure this out for you guys. And I never, ever tie on a spoon. I mean, maybe that one, maybe that won me a championship if I had of last weekend, right? The one thing I'll say about them is when it's windy, the only direction that I can be accurate throwing those things is directly downwind. They, 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 they catch that. I've never seen a lure that you throw it and it can make a 90 degree turn while it's flying through the air. It, and that's one of the reasons I don't throw it a whole lot because I am 
my style of fishing, I'm a precision guy. I, I, I see the fish, I see the wakes or something. I want it right there. I mean, you've been fishing with me. I'll, I'll, I, I want it six inches in front of his face right now. Probably not casting unless I get in that situation. So the spoon just has not been strong for me. I know people, uh, a good friend of mine's wife will murder most adult male fishermen and she's going to do it with a spoon. She is going to just wreck you with that thing. I know they're effective dag nabbit. I just, I just don't throw them. I, I, I don't know why I just don't. No, I totally get it. It's, uh, it took me a while to, to get confident with it, but it's a lure that I've found. It does take a little bit of adjustment with your casting and it's like, especially on windy days, it's 90% underhand because I've found that keeping it closer to the water uh, allows it to not catch as much wind because the higher up you get, you know, the more it's going to, it's going to catch draft. But I've found that's one of my favorite lures on windy days because I can, continue to cast it far and i find that especially when i'm in the boat you know if i'm waiting it doesn't matter as much and a lot of times i will wait on windy days but if i'm in the boat i find it's really important to get my lure as far away from me as possible hole slap is a huge problem on windy days i'm sure you can attest to that as well being that you do a lot of sight fishing uh but i've found that it's really important to choose lures that you can really get far away from you and you can cover distance because we both know that fishing is a numbers game and the more fish you can put your lure in front of, uh, the more fish you're going to catch. And if you can't cast very far because your lure is getting caught with the wind, or you can only, you know, cover half your distance that you usually can on a calm day, uh, your number of fish you catch is going to go significantly down. So that's why I tend, I tend to lean towards spoons a lot. I'm surprised to hear that, you know, you're not a huge fan of them, but I know that you have lures that you do find effective. So in terms of castability, what would be like your number one choice for a lure that you can get distance out of and efficiently kind of cover an area. Uh, Cause you know, we're going to be doing a lot of searching around on these windy days to find what patterns these fish are in. You know, I, I guess to be fair, my spinner base could be considered a spoon. They're doing the same thing that spoon is doing. And I do really like throwing those guys. Uh, okay. So maybe, maybe I needed to go to that. Um, I have had a lot of times where I feel them hit, hit the spoon on it instead of the, the plastic that's behind it. But you raise a, a really good point. Um, I'm throwing a quarter ounce jig head or heavier on days like that. And I don't care if the water's one foot deep or eight foot deep. I'm throwing a heavy jig head. Uh, if, if I'm in grass, I'll throw a heavy belly weighted weedless. But I'm definitely getting away from that boat, away from that hole slap, away from all that noise. Uh, my my go-to on a wind day, windy day is going to be that one quarter um, – you know, maybe a three eighths or something like that. And I'm probably going to have a plastic on that doesn't have a whole lot of wind drag. I like little short, like three and a half inch plastics, little paddle tails. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm jealous that you came up with a good point before I did why it is, is yes. You want, it doesn't happen often. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you want something heavy. You can get away from you. And even, you know, even the, the pop and cork on a spinning rod, I throw it on a spin rod instead of a bait caster because I can just rear back and launch that spinning rod and get it away from me. Uh, one of the coolest things you can do with a popping cork on a windy day is throw it out, pop, 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 and then open your bell and let it get further from you and do it again. Uh, you know, Hey, story time. Ooh. So, so Daniel and I, the, what, what we fished on day one and you know, we just didn't get the right bites in Louisiana, the, the limits, the limits 27 inches and we were catching the 27 and a halves, which, the game plan we had, we knew it'd be that way. We had fish that were 26 and a half to 27 and a half. And we knew we were going to need to catch numbers to weed through that. But we were on a nine to nine and a half pound average. If we did that, uh, the weather took that away from us. But w the way we fished is we, there was this long winding drain that ended up in this big flat. Right. And the one thing that, that is true at almost all times is those drains going back to those flats. If there's good tidal movement through it, they're deeper than everything else. If you are fishing a drain that has soft, soft mud on the bottom and it's real shallow, well, that means there's not tidal movement through it. And that's probably not where you want to be fishing at good weather or bad weather. It's just that simple. But those ones that have the firmer bottoms, they're deeper. That means there's water moving in and out. So there's bait moving in and out. So there's fish moving in and out. Well, so we go up to this drain and, and again, going back to what we were talking about earlier, we fully expected those fish to be near the flat they came off of 
waiting to go back on it, right? And so we 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 troll back up in there nice and quiet. And sure enough, there's 20 or 30 fish and they are piled up right in the front of this drain. Unfortunately, it was, you know, the high pressure deal. They didn't want to eat a whole lot. I think we caught a we caught a nine and a quarter that was about 27 and a half off of it. Uh, caught a couple six pounders, stuff like that. But we got all the way up this drain and the wind's in our face the whole time. It's blowing northwest and the wind's in our face. We finally get up on the to the to the very top of this drain. We power pull down and the idea is we had all these fish that we had pushed off into that drain. We're just going to fish them all day long. We're going to grind them, grind them, grind them. And it was about an hour and a half into it. Daniel had caught a really good one that was too big. Uh, uh, another six something that came in the boat. And we're just going to, we're just going to make it happen. We need three fish on day one. Daniel throws out, right? And he's th- using a spinner with a popping cork. He throws out, well, as spinners will often do, the bell shuts and snap, pops him off, right? And so his, his, his court goes way out in the ditch and I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm going to be honest. I'm, I'm a pretty happy go lucky, uh, easy guy to be around except tournament day. I just, I've got a chip on my shoulder. I want to, I want to pr- produce every single tournament. So when it's not going good, I, I don't, I, I don't yell and be mean by any means, but I get pretty serious and, and I'll say what I'm thinking. And I looked at Daniel, I said, if that dang court goes down right now, I'm going to lose my mind. And it wasn't five seconds later, whoop, that cork's gone with, you know, and it's broke off. Right. And I was like, Oh, that's about right. Yep. And so we fish another hour. Well, about, I don't know, a hundred yards down the drain. I see this cork pop back up <laughs> and, uh, I was like, I, I can't stand it. I got to go see what's on it. Right. And so we're drifting up to it and it gets off the front of the boat. I get down on my knees and I grab the cork. When I grab the cork, something takes it out of my hand. I'm like, what in the world, right? And so we drop the power poles and the cork goes around behind the boat, which is now upwind and about, a, I don't know, 30 to 32 mile an hour wind. And so now I've got a plastic with a jig head on it. And I'm fishing for this cork, Jack. And the cork pops up and I finally make a cast on it where I hook it and I pull the cork up real slow. I get up beside the boat. Daniel grabs it, jerks it out of the water. Dude, there's like a four pound largemouth bass on this dang cork. <laughs> I said, of all the things we could catch on tournament day, we caught a trophy bass. I caught five bass on Friday. I, I told I told Daniel, I said, look, I'm leaving the redfish tour and I'm heading to the lake, baby. I mean, it's time to it's time to get a pointy nose boat that goes real fast. And, you know, uh, I think I've been, you know, I know a lot of pro bass fishermen. Uh, you gotta have a really, a really snazzy haircut with gel in your hair. You gotta have some, you know, some some name brand like Kenneth Cole glasses. They and very earring. tight Something square like lenses. You, you got to have little square ones and, and earrings are a thing now I've noticed. So I'm prepared, man. I'm catching bass. I'm going to, I don't even really wear glasses that much. I'm going to get me some, but yeah, the, the, the things that happen out there, we've got stories for days on that, but oh, okay. anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll head back towards where you wanted this podcast to go. Um, I'm pretty bad about taking a right turn here and there. No, that's okay. I'm sure, you know, it's funny. We actually did some tips on bass the other day and people seem to really enjoy it. You know, we look at how many comments and how many views they get. And even though we put out a lot of really great saltwater tips for redfish, trout, flounder, and snook, every angler, I can almost guarantee started out with bass. So I'm sure everyone enjoyed that story as well. But to kind of also piggyback on that, the effectiveness of popping corks on windy days, especially with windblown shorelines. The tactic you just talked about, I made a couple tips on it last spring, fishing with both artificial lures under the cork and with live bait, throwing on one of those windblown shorelines, like getting really far away from the shoreline, pop, pop, pop. If you sit there, you wait, you don't get a whole lot, open that bale and let it get closer to the shoreline. You can literally feel out an entire shoreline just letting that cork drift. And you can't do that with any other bait. Uh, it's, it's, I, I, I'm not going to lie to you. I don't like taking popping corks out and using them. I'm not a giant fan of them in any scenario other than springtime windblown shoreline fishing, just because the fish are starting to get fired back up with the warm weather. They're like attracted to really loud splashing sounds like top water starting to fire back up again. But those windblown shorelines, man, if you throw those corks out there, like I was using the power prawn, which you might not know, it's a new shrimp that we've come out with here at salt strong under one of those corks. And I had like one of my best trout days fishing along like a cut edge, like you were talking about those drains. For those of you who might not know what a drain is, again, just a depth change that comes out of like a marsh area or a flat that's very defined. If you look on Google maps, these are those dark spots that are like 
choke points between two different bodies of water, usually one bigger, one smaller. On outgoing tides, they're phenomenal places to fish because all that bait gets concentrated through the drain. So throwing that cork up against that bank, it just pop, pop and letting it drip. I mean, oh my goodness you can have all the fish you want. Even redfish will do it as well if you're fishing shallower areas. That just happened to be a trout example. But gosh, popping corks, uh, very, very underrated presentation for windy days. Do you, I mean, was that just a one-off thing or do you use them a lot as well, even when you're fishing tournaments? I would be, I would be competent to say that a popping cork and gulp has probably won more tournaments than every other lure out combined. I'd, especially, uh, for sure in Texas, for sure in Texas, um, over here in Louisiana, I see a lot more of the football style cork with a lure behind it and they kind of rip it instead of pop it. But in Texas, I, man, I would, I would bet my last dollar and eat my shoe. If somebody said that popping corks have won less than every other lure combined. And they, you know, I, I'm very fortunate in that, uh, my circle of friends are some of the, you know, the top tournament fishermen in the state and there's a saying that we have and it's called death by popping cork and when we see this bad weather coming that's what they say hope you got the popping cork loaded up because it's death by popping cork this weekend and even even you know even across the middle of lakes you know uh, drifting with that thing launching it way out there and just cracking it and it's it's a very effective tool i one thing that i had to learn coming from being a trout guy to a redfish guy is that when you're in the bay fishing for fish, you usually have a longer leader, like a two or three foot leader on your popping court. Uh, in the marshes, very rarely do I have more than a 12 inch leader on it. I want that lure close to the sound. Most of the time it's two or three foot deep, you know, where we're fishing. If you're, you know, somewhere on the East Coast where I don't know how you crazies have that six foot tide swing, but if you're in six foot of water, maybe let it out some. But for the most of us that are, our redfish waters are two or three foot deep, that 12 inch leader does great. Oh yeah, you go talk to our buddy Judd Brock. He's fishing those DOA shrimp under those corks. Gosh, that guy, it'll be like a five foot leader around some of those points. But you really, I mean, the the current there, you do have to swing it too. So it's a it's a little bit of a different story. Um, I know we've got some listeners that are in the Carolinas, in Georgia, on Northeast Florida. You know, that's that's a pretty good presentation. I know one of our other coaches, Richard, has put out two really solid popping cork tips over the past couple of weeks. Definitely check those out. We'll link them in the, the description below. But again, you guys are hearing it. Popping corks can be pretty killer uh, to go with. I, I I like the Paradise Poppers. Um, I think those are awesome. I also use like the Four Horsemen. Uh, I think those are like the loudest ones that you can use. Do you have a, a preference on what popping cork you like? I use I use one called a High Water. It's made here in Florida. Um, uh, George Spivey, he's a guide over here in Leeville that makes them. And it's very similar to the Four Horsemen. It's real loud. It's got a little plastic ramp on the bottom of it with ceramic beads. So when you crack it, it's super loud. The reason I prefer the high water is they have perfected a titanium wire inside of it. And so it doesn't, you can't kink it. You can't ruin it. And me being a guy who I want to spend my time fishing and figuring stuff out and not retying stuff, I've gotten really into those high waters and, and, they're, they've, they've done a very good job for me of short of, uh, you know, just wearing one out, uh, or I have a lot of problems with alligators biting mine, mostly because if I see an alligator, I throw it at them because I think it's, I think it's great fun to watch that thing sneak up on my popping cork. And sometimes I'm not fast enough on getting it back. You should see some of the gators we're seeing over here right now. Yesterday I was trying to get my phone out. I would have sent you a picture of it. I guarantee you every bit of 14 foot just sitting on the bank. Uh, there was one, there was about a 12 footer the other day. And my dog, Steve was on the front of the boat, you know, like come over here, big boys, see what happens. But uh, the, um, the four horsemen is great. Uh, the high water is good. Those are probably the two that I'd really get into. Uh, there's a brand called mid coast and they make some that are really, really castable. Um, you know, I, I throw a lot of mid coast, but the high water is just for longevity and the sound they make has been really good. Oh yeah. Um, have you uh, follow up question? Have you ever had any problems with gators grabbing your redfish in tournaments? Uh, well, again, you've fished with me before. I use a pretty stiff rod and fifty pound braid. And one thing that that is that you learn as a tournament fisherman is you want that fish feeling good and being fresh when he gets in your live well, so he'll stay alive and be strong. 
Therefore, whenever I catch one, usually he skips across the top of the water back to the boat. <laughs> you know, Dan Daniel looks more when he's back there with the net to to get the fish. He looks more like he's catching a butterfly in the air as I have this thing sailing towards the boat. Uh, so no, I have not had problems with alligators just yet, but it it could probably happen one day. Oh, I hope I hope not for your sake. Um, well, man, I we've covered so much in this podcast. I feel like we're probably coming up on the point where listeners probably are getting off to to get their exit for work. Um, I think we've, is there anything else that we need to leave these folks with as they head out to fish in some of this nasty weather uh, that we haven't covered already? I just don't be scared of it. And the fact of the matter is at some point you are going to have to fish in, in acclimate conditions. Is that even a word? Yep. In, I, in acclimate ooh, or <laughs> nailed it, nailed it. I, you know, before I was a dumb little fisherman, I actually had an education, right? Uh, but, uh, at some point in your life, you're going to have to fish those kind of conditions. There's no reason to not get out there and learn them. There's a, there's this, there's this thing amongst people when they see a well-known guy entering a tournament, they get kind of freaked out. Like, man, we don't have a chance. And the fact of the matter is most of those guides, when the weather's real bad, they cancel their trips just like I would do, you know, nothing against them, but they just don't run their trips those days. So whenever that tournament rolls around and that weather's nasty, those tournament guys that have learned how to fish that nasty conditions, have so much more of an advantage over what you know people uh, what the guide has right so if you ever have a reason to maybe you want to enter your local fun tournament or anything like that it's time to get out there and learn it go have a go out, you know go have a good time and if you don't catch fish that day for a change you have an excuse why you didn't catch fish right so like your friends can't make fun of you dude it's blowing 30 what what do you want me to do right <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, you, you've got a you've got a very good point there, especially if you are going to be entering tournaments. But for those who do just go out to have fun and fish, I think it's important to know what the behaviors of the species that you're after are. And knowing those behaviors also needs to factor in those days that aren't fishable or those days that it's hard to fish and knowing what they're doing during those days. So again, as we talked about at the very beginning of this podcast, as you approach a fishing trip, you need to look at the macro view. So even if you are going to be fishing a nice day, the couple days prior to that, they might have been in one of those nasty weather patterns. So knowing what they do, if you go out and you do fish one of those days, you're able to observe what their patterns are. You learn a lot more even for the good days, the days where it's not inclement weather. Sorry, it's not an acclimate. I had to, I had to verify. Inclement. Yeah, we do have a lot of vocab checkers uh, and we would have gotten called out for that. So I, I, I figured I, I'd, I'd jump the gun on it. I've been, I, I have been in Louisiana, the tip of the boot for a week and a half. Okay. I, 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 I apologize if I mispronounce something. I haven't understood what people have told me in a week and a half. And, sure. and, and I'm saying this lovingly because a lot of these people are my very good friends. And it's like, man, I only knew a half of what you said. I love that half, but let's revisit the other half because I didn't catch any of it. <laughs> well, we're gonna we're gonna forgive you for any mispronunciations or any uh, <laughs> any vocab uh, misunderstandings because you've been down in Louisiana. We love our Louisiana insiders as well. Um, but man, what a great podcast. We've got a ton of other awesome information from you in the Insider Club. If anyone wants to see more from Caleb, we'll also leave his contact information below. Um, he has a ton of really great info he shared with us up in the Matagorda area or just tactics for targeting redfish. Uh, I can't wait to get out again with him soon and film some more tips. We just knew it'd be fun to have a podcast for you guys today, considering that we're both stuck inside during this really terrible weather. But Caleb, we wish you the best in your upcoming tournament. Uh, is there anything else you want to leave us with? Uh, the you know, only thing I gather from this, we're telling everybody to go fishing while both of us are sitting inside recording a podcast while it's blowing 30, right? <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm going to head out this evening. I don't know about you. <laughs> I, I've been in it for 10 days. I've been in it for 10 days. I'm, 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 I'm going to take a break. I'm going to go eat lunch after this. It's going to be great. I haven't had lunch in a very long time. <laughs> well, you enjoy it, man. Everyone, thank you so much again for watching. We will see you in the Salt Strong Insider Club. And if you have any questions about the stuff we talked about, there is a comment section below. If you're watching this on YouTube or if you're listening to it on the podcast section, go to the site to saltstrong.com. We will have a full blog post where you guys can talk with us. Caleb will probably be in there answering questions as well. So we're looking forward to seeing you in there. And thank you again so much for watching.